Is that the black Santa Claus? I want a Super Nintendo. Yeah. Sega Genesis. Street Fighter 2. It's 12.30 a.m. Christmas Eve, I'm out with the gangsters and thieves Celebrated, posted up with eggnog, hand it up in my cup Put Rudolph and Moses, Lil Bang Bang in the... I'm sure this is just a regular ass beat em up, most gamers wouldn't give a second thought But it's special to me because for starters, I love Capcom to death And they're known for some of the hottest beat em ups to ever grace the arcade scene But Final Fight 3 is unique because out of the other two Final Fights this one had branching paths, Street Fighter style inputs for the moves. In fact, each character can pick up their own unique weapon and they'll get a new combo string while they have the weapon. For example, Guy can pick up nunchucks and he'll get a new combo attack. Lucia can pick up the baton and she'll also get a new combo attack. I'm not exactly sure if Dean gets a new combo attack when he picks up the hammer, but I know he can throw it with electrical power. And I'm pretty sure Hag Hagger just has his trusty pipe like always. But without spending too much time on this one, I always like the overall vibe and environment of the game. It's got that 90s criminal thug gangster environment thing going for it. Plus it's dark as fuck low key. After the end of the first stage in the cutscene, Dean tells me the bad guys killed his whole fucking family just cause he didn't want to be down with the gang. Damn Capcom, are you gonna punish the new protagonist for taking a stand against gang violence? Couldn't they have wrote it to where maybe his family got like kidnapped or something? Anyway. Okay, first off, you get to be a fucking cowboy. Yippee ki yay, motherfucker! Oh, wait, wrong media. But seriously, who didn't have fun playing this whether you were playing it at the arcade or at home? I can't sit here and tell you the differences between the home and arcade ports because I'm not super in love with the game, but I still like it a little more than Super Contra or Super Castlevania just for the fact that Konami tried something new and it happened to be a smash hit in the arcades and at home. Beat that Super Contra and Super Castlevania. My personal favorite character to play as was always Cormano because A, he has a shotgun, and B, He's the most unique looking out of the four, and I always tend to gravitate towards the guy that stands out from the rest of the group. Plus, I like all the different boss fights. I really like fighting the two assholes who throw bombs at you in the saloon, and when you fight the Indian chief guy. It's also cool how the Indian dude is the only boss you don't kill in the game for obvious reasons. Ready for power. I'll start by saying I think this game is criminally underrated. Maybe I feel this way because I'm into Gundam Wing and all that 80s and 90s anime style which is exactly what Cybernator gives you. I'm trying to tell you though, this game legit does everything right. The soundtrack's good, the graphics are good, gameplay good, it's challenging but also not that bullshit unfair Ghosts and Goblins level difficulty. This game also has branching paths and I believe it has multiple endings as well. But back to the graphics, honestly all of the stages look fantastic, and the soundtrack complements it perfect. I don't even know how to describe it, but I always get super involved when I play this game. Like, the music alone just makes you feel like you're the main character in this 90s sci-fi anime. Only unlike in the anime, you do not kill everything with ease. Every enemy on screen is a threat, no matter how big or small. The game also has a level up system with the weapons you find. You start with a machine gun and a punch attack, but you can level both weapons up, plus other weapons you'll pick up in the later levels. My advice to you is to pick up as many power-ups as you can, and whatever you do, don't miss out on picking up any new weapon. Each weapon appears in its respective level, and if you complete the level without grabbing the new weapon, then that, as they say, is bat and you don't get the weapon, and you do need it to progress. You can only get so far with just a machine gun and a punch. Another Konami banger for the arcade at home. I swear in the 90s, Konami turned a few cartoons into more than respectable video games. The Simpsons, Ninja Turtles, X-Men, you name it. 
But the thing is, out of the three cartoons I mentioned, this wasn't the only Ninja Turtles arcade game Konami made. The Ninja Turtle game they made prior to Turtles in Time was also a smash hit in the arcades and at home. Clearly it did well enough for Konami to try their hand at making another Ninja Turtles game that turned out to be arguably better than the first. The graphics were improved, the turtles could do dash attacks, they also had this dope ass throw you could do that would toss an enemy right out of the screen and into your face. Whoa! But seriously, I always got a kick out of it. There's also a boss fight with Shredder where the only way to hurt him is to launch a foot planet his machine he's attacking you with. I won't lie, gameplay wise it's not a whole lot different from previous Ninja Turtle games. But I don't know, something about this game got my attention more than the original or even the console only Ninja Turtle game for the NES. I think I was really into the time travel concept of the game. One stage was a prehistoric age, another was a wild wild west stage, a future stage, pirates, you get the idea. The previous Ninja Turtle game was pretty much New York City in the Technodrome, but in this one you truly are some Ninja Turtles kicking ass in different periods of time. Yeah, cowabunga indeed, turtle power and all that. Now I'll be the first to say that I'm typically not the biggest fan of RPGs, especially turn-based RPGs. But RPGs like this one or Final Fantasy VI or VII are exceptions. Now I'll admit that I'm not the best at turn-based RPGs and I rarely complete them, but that doesn't mean I don't enjoy these type of games. Earthbound in particular was a unique RPG because to me it broke the mold for RPGs at the time. Instead of the usual medieval or Lord of the Rings style atmosphere with mythical creatures, you're in a modern environment with robots, possessed townsfolk and animals, aliens, and other inanimate objects that have come to life thanks to the notoriously difficult to kill Gigas. As I said before, I never beat this game myself, but obviously I still know about the final boss fight, which everyone knows is one of the most epic of all time. So spoiler alert, you and your pals are no match for Gigas and you get the shit kicked out of you and the only way to beat him is to pray. Yeah, that's right, pray. I know how funny that sounds, but the girl member of your group is the only member with the option to pray during battle. So I guess the strategy is to keep her alive long enough until you've prayed enough. I guess it's sort of like a DBZ Goku spear bomb type deal. But I've watched the final boss fight and it's actually kind of moving the way Paula basically prays for everyone you've met along the way to help you in your seemingly hopeless battle. I guess you never should underestimate the power of prayer. Now I've already told you that I'm a legit Capcom fanboy, so it shouldn't be too surprising to see a Mega Man game on this list. The pre-Mega Man X games were cool, but I've always preferred Mega Man X series because, again, it's got that badass 90s anime vibe going for it. And let's face it, Zero is dope as fuck and is slightly up there in terms of my personal favorite Capcom characters. Honestly, all three Mega Man X games are good, but I didn't want to waste three slots, so I went with X3 because it's my personal favorite out of the three. As funny as it sounds, one of the main things I love about Mega Man is the soundtrack. I can honestly tell you the Mega Man franchise always has the best music in their games. After all, Mega Man is Rockman in Japan, and all the games do have some rockin' tunes. X3 has a more dark and grittier soundtrack than the other two. I especially like the music in Tunnel Rhino and Neon Tigers levels. Plus, X3 is the first game that allows you to play as my beloved Zero. I also like Vile, and I think he's a pretty badass character in his own right, so it's nice to see him make a return. The only negative I have about this game when compared to the other two is that you can't unlock a Street Fighter move like you could in the other two. In X1, you can get the Hadouken, in X2, you can get the Shoryuken, but in this one, I think you get like a gold armor chip or something like that. Yeah, fuck that, man. Give me a new Street Fighter move. Spoiler alert, this is the only Mario game we're going to see on this list. I still love Mario to death, but Yoshi's Island was something special. I guess you can call it a prequel of sorts since Mario and Luigi are babies and Yoshi is a protagonist. The graphics and music were vastly improved from any previous Mario game, and instead of jumping on enemies like the Mario Brothers, you aim and shoot eggs at your enemies or you can stomp on them with Yoshi's down B attack from Super Smash. The little watermelon power-ups are kinda cool too. 
But if you all would like, you're more than welcome to vent in the comments about Mario's incessant crying and how crazy it made you. Almost made you want to toss a little bastard over the cliff like that penguin in Mario 64. And by the way, if you did throw that penguin off the cliff in Mario 64, then I don't want you subscribing to my channel, you heartless bastard. Nah, no, I'm just kidding. I need all the support I can get, even from deranged child penguin murderers. But I'm not judging. But seriously though, that crying was annoying as fuck. But on a more positive note, I think this game also had one of the dopest boss fights. So if you played Yoshi's Island, you understand how every new enemy you encounter in a new stage ends up becoming a boss because that wizard asshole sprinkles them with PCP and turns them into monsters. So what do you think happens when Kamek sprinkles the PCP dust on Lil Baby Bowser? Play Yoshi's Island and see for yourself. So you might like Mortal Kombat more, Tekken more, King of Fighters more, whatever. But we all know the Street Fighter franchise practically invented the 2D side-scrolling fighting game. The first Street Fighter was an arcade only, uh, more or less, and was pretty much a rough draft of what fighting games in general would eventually become. So in 1991 when Street Fighter 2 hit the arcade scene, it was as if the first one never existed. Street Fighter 2 literally changed the entire arcade scene as a whole. And I believe the Super Nintendo was released in 91 also, so you knew Capcom had to port it over to the SNES. So from 92 to 93, you got about three different versions of Street Fighter 2. First, you got Street Fighter 2 World Warrior, which is the original Street Fighter 2. Then they released the Champion Edition, which allowed you to play as the four computer-controlled only final bosses, Balrog, Vega, Sagatan, and Bison. And then they would release Street Fighter 2 Hyper Fighting, which was essentially the same as Champ Edition, but with faster gameplay, and some of the characters got new moves. Notably, Chun-Li was blessed with her new Kikoken, which allowed her to now punish you with fireball pressure. So, after about two years, three versions of the same game, guess what? They make a fourth version, but it also features four brand new spanking new fighters. Fei Long, Kami, DJ, and T-Hawk. Honestly, T-Hawk and DJ were kind of lame, with the exception of DJ's machine gun upper. Fei Long and Kami were the real stars of the show. Fei Long was one of the first Bruce Lee inspired characters in a fighting game, and boy was I in love. Next to Chun-Li, he's the fastest character in the game and surprisingly hits like a truck. Kami ended up becoming the real star though. Capcom would go on to put her in all types of other Street Fighter and Capcom related games. In fact, she basically got her own video game called Cannon Spike released for the Sega Dreamcast, which is named after one of her moves. So even though Super Street Fighter 2 was pretty much the same game as the previous three versions, the addition of Kami and Chun-Li damn near turned it into a whole new Street Fighter game. Kinda, but not really. As a kid, I remember in 1995, the PlayStation had just came out, but also they re-released the Super NES. Only the re-release of the Super NES console came with Killer Instinct. Now at this time, I was only five and had just started getting into video games, but mainly fighting games. I had seen Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, but Killer Instinct was a new kid on the block. But what if I told you this new kid on the block is mixed? He's one half Mortal Kombat, the other half Street Fighter. Seriously though, Killer Instinct took Street Fighter's button scheme and blocking style, but added in their own combo system which also featured Combo Breakers, a defense option that allows you to stop your opponent from starting up a combo through guessing the buttons of the move your opponent started the combo with. For example, if I use a super move with a medium punch button, and my opponent presses medium punch and medium kick at the correct time, then cook a cook a cook a combo breaker! My combo's been broken. Mortal Kombat would also adapt this feature many years later. Yeah, that's right, Mortal Kombat, you ain't slick. I also thought Killer Instinct had a pretty robust character selection too. I mean, ninjas, army men, karate dudes, forearm monsters, they're cool. But don't you want to play as a werewolf or a velociraptor or a man made entirely of flames? Well, Killer Instinct can make that happen. Killer Instinct also had their own fatalities, but I'll be honest, Mortal Kombat's were way more gruesome and over the top. 
Killer Instincts were more mild and toned down. If I had to pick, I'd probably say none of them were any good. They're like PG-13 fatalities, and the Ultra Combos were basically like brutalities in Mortal Kombat, minus the opponent exploding into a bloody mess at the end. Killer Instinct also had these lame-ass finishers called Humiliations, where the winner makes the loser dance. Yeah, that's right, dance. I guess that was their attempt at making something like a friendship in Mortal Kombat. Uh, yeah, could you guys not? But other than that, Killer Instinct is still arguably the best fighting game on the console. But in Street Fighter's defense, the company that developed Mortal Kombat Rare, they had about four years to make it happen. But in those four years, Rare really did their homework on fighting games. Too bad Rare really isn't a thing anymore. But at least to this day, the Killer Instinct scene is still going strong. If you're a fighting game head like me, check out some matches on YouTube. Good stuff. So perhaps I was a little coerced into putting Zelda at the number one spot like most video game aficionados would do. And again, I mentioned earlier that I'm not the best at RPGs in general. It's not really that I'm bad at them, it's more or less the fact that I rarely have the patience or the discipline to see them through to the end. A Link to the Past was no different. I am 30 and I've never really completed a Zelda game before. Yeah, that's right, go ahead and laugh it up. But as I've said before, that still doesn't take away from my experience of playing the game, which was very enjoyable. I don't really know how to put it into words, but Zelda gives you such a unique experience that most games just simply can't give you. I like the items you get, the people you meet, the places you go. I played Ocarina before I played Link to the Past. As a kid, I probably would have told you Ocarina is the best, but in my adult years, I've come to like Link to the Past more. I feel like if Link to the Past had 3D graphics like Ocarina, then it would be twice as good. For some reason, I really liked Aghanim as a villain. I guess it was nice to see a new antagonist that's not Ganon or Ganondorf. Only when you beat him, spoiler alert, it was Ganon the whole time. But at least they threw him in as a plot twist. I also feel like story-wise there's a lot going on, even more so than Ocarina. Like I feel like Link to the Past has more of a backstory than Ocarina. I really wish I can go more into detail on why Link to the Past is such a great game, but I honestly feel you do better to just watch a YouTube about Link to the Past from someone who's a bit more familiar with the game. You know, someone who's actually beat the game multiple times. But despite my Zelda shortcomings, I've always been fascinated with Zelda lore. Just don't ask me to try to put the games in chronological order. Like I said, that kind of thing is reserved for the real Zelda MVPs. So there you have it, those are my top 10 Super NES games, so please like, please comment, please subscribe, and please enjoy the rest of your day.